Good morning, my dear students. I am your editor, and I am going to deliver my lecture on Tintanabe, one of the finest poems of William Wordsworth. The poem, commonly known as Tintanabe, actually has a much longer title. And when the poem first appeared in Illegal Lyrical Ballads, 1798, as a last-minute addition, it bore the title as it is quoted: "Lines written or composed a few miles above Tintanabe." On revisiting the banks of the Wai during a tour, July 13, 1798, and I have mentioned it when I was conducting my classes on Wordsworth's Tintanabe. During the lockdown, I couldn't finish my topic, so I am on the way to deliver my lecture on this poem, and I will highlight on the remaining part of this poem as well. William Wordsworth wrote the poem after visiting the ruins of the medieval abbey. on the england wells border and was so pleased with it he sent it to his publishers asking it to be included at the 11th hour in the collection of poems he and his friend samuel taylor coleridge had written so my dear students you have a clear idea about this that it was included in lyrical ballads when it was published yes it was published in 1798 Wordsworth actually composed the poem in the bustling city although he began composing the poem in his head while still in the Wai valley he wrote it down while sitting in the parlor of the publisher Joseph Cottle was the publisher and it was in Bristol many poems that Wordsworth composed they were called the momentary poems as the poems were were coming out of his of a moment you have already gone through in your in his in your class 11 you have already gone through the poem written by william wordsworth that is upon the westminster bridge it was also a momentary poem so we have found out when wordsworth visited uh, the very beautiful landscapes he actually recorded the memory in his heart and when he returned from that place to his own city that is the city of hustle and bustle london city city of london and he actually sat down on the chair and he was trying to write it out from his memory so it was one of the hallmarks in william wordsworth's life as well so william wordsworth has considered that the nature and natural outings they have actually provided the great impetus to wordsworth to compose poetry and that is why wordsworth is considered to be a nature worshipper and a nature priest as well wordsworth actually he was deeply moved by the by the sights and he for the first time went there in in the year of 1793 so in his first visit what he saw and in the second visit that he made in 1798 what he so as well so during the during the five years he has spent lots of changes can take place and it took place in nature perhaps it took place in himself as well so when for the second time he went there to tintanabe and he was delighted to have a pictorial beauty of the landscape but perhaps he was not amused as he was when he came there for the first time in the year 1793 so we will record or rather wordsworth has recorded he has recorded the he has recorded a good ambience there so tintern abbe tintern abbe records the development of wordsworth from the thoughtless youth to the hermit of nature and he can now meditate deeply and understand the meaning of life as well so wordsworth he was a nature priest and he was trying to focus on the beautiful things of nature my question is that did he notice any changes taking place in nature in his second visit my next question is that did he 
find out any changes taking place in himself i have discussed it in my classes as well and you can easily answer the sir wordsworth wordsworth was a changed person nothing was changed in nature and that's why we recommend that nature is unchanged it is the man who changes and changes for the better wordsworth himself later recalled quoted no poem of mine was composed under circumstances more pleasant for me to remember than this i began it upon leaving tinton after crossing the y and concluded it just as why i was entering bristol in the evening after a ramble of four or five days with my sister not a line of it altered and not any part of it written down till i reached bristol uncooked so this was the thing that he recalled the poem is a remarkable revelation of the poet's nature creed the poet was a passionate lover and reverent worshipper tinder abbe briefly records three stages in the growth of his love of nature which are stated at a much greater length as well the first stage in his love of nature was a healthy boy's delight in freedom and the open air and i discussed it in the class as well how did he release those moments when he came to tinton abbey five years ago that is in the year 1793 so as a boy he was deeply moved and very much captivated by the ravishing beauty of the nature it was it was a nice ambience for him to walk alone and that the glad glad quoted the glad animal moment of boyhood he records he records it in his famous poem lines composed a few miles above tinton abbey on revisiting the banks of the wye during a tour july 13 1798 so my dear students you should remember the full title of the poem and it can be asked in the examination as well as you do have objective type questions in your exam wordsworth in his first visit he was just enjoying the beautiful nature out of his external senses and as he quoted in his poem quote like a roe i bounded over the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams wherever nature led so in his first visit he was just he was just uh, dancing in the rhythmic cadences of nature and natural elements the lofty cliffs the beautiful landscape the green meadows the hill the sounding cataract all these are beautiful elements of nature and in his first visit to tinter in the year 1793 he was really enjoyed at heart and he was really enjoying releasing the opportunities that he had caught so he was just recording that and it is the boy's delightment that he has referred to it as well the poem details the poem is generally known as wordsworth's spiritual autobiography and i have instructed you my dear students that you should write a note on wordsworth's tinton abbey as his spiritual autobiography i think you haven't forgot that so i was discussing the matter so closely and so minutely to you so that you could have a clear idea and i think you can bridge the gap what i missed to comment on that and now because of the lockdown we couldn't 
directly meet with each other. So I have to take this health to upload my audio lecture on the college YouTube channel. And I think you can watch it and I am very much sure that you will understand it better. Tintonabe is generally known as Wordsworth's spiritual autobiography and like his long poem, the famous one, the prelude, the poem records his growth as a poet. The poem is a romantic return to nature. As in the romantic age, we have discussed many a thing, especially return to nature. This is one of the salient features of the romanticism as well. The search for the beautiful and the permanent forms which incorporate primitive human goodness. So Tintonabe distills and retells the maturation process of the poet himself, his imagination, his relationship with nature through a narrative of Wordsworth's time spent on the banks of the beautiful river Y, W Y E, yes, that is the river. And I have uploaded the picture of the river Y in my audio lecture. So I have I have prepared this video and this video has the beautiful images of the rapturous beautiful river Y and its remembrances of it. So Tintern Abbey records the development of Wordsworth and I have talked about in the class as well. So Tintern Abbey records the growth and development of a person and it records the growth of a person from a thoughtless youth to a thoughtful hermit. Yes, my dear students, the transformation from a thoughtless youth, a real wanderer to a thoughtful hermit, a person with wisdom. To some degree, Tintanabe presents absorb, absorption in natural beauty as a solution to mental, political and social disconnection. The second stage was his love for the sensuous beauty of nature. So in the first stage, it was called that it was the enjoyment on the part of a boy. So in his first visit, he was really delighted to have the beautiful natural elements and he was just uh, running in the rhythmic cadences of nature. He danced as he liked to have. He smiled as he wanted. It was his great delightment and it was his great connection with nature. And in the very first visit, whatever he saw, whatever he heard, about the beautiful nature, all were recorded not in his internal senses but in the external senses. So this was not the maturation that he had caught in his first visit. The maturation, the development dwelt in him and perhaps in the gap of five years he has experienced many a thing in his life. So that gap finally fulfilled the gap what he had when he came here in the year 1793 and when he secondly visited there in the year 1798. So first stage it was all about the glad animal movement of boyhood as he was like a row as he mentioned in his poem like a small deer he was just moving here and there he was just releasing the beautiful nature the second stage was his love for his, for the sensuous beauty of nature, a love which was altogether untouched by intellectual interest, the kind of passion which found such full expressions in the poetry of Keats. Keats, one of the finest poets of the Romantic age as well. So, poetry of Keats also have the record of this thing as Wordsworth recorded it in his Tintern Quoted, the sounding cataract 
haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite. So my dear friends, my dear students, these are the natural elements, the sounding cataract, the mountain, the deep and the gloomy wood, this vast landscape, the beautiful landscape, the beautiful elements of nature, all together supplied the energy to his body, to his mind. And he was just taking it in his bounty. The second stage passed, quoted the digi raptures, unquote, produced by the beauteous forms of nature, gave place to something more profound and spiritual. The period of the senses was followed by the period of the soul. So this is the maturation. Not that he lost his deep delight in nature. His love of nature was now subdued to a dominant scheme of thought and become and became fellow inmate in his mind with the love of man and with a deep sense of pathos as well. So this is the transformation. This is the transformation that was undergoing. So, so far, we can go through the poem. You can easily read this. I think you have completed the reading of it. So, I am not here to read the lines for you. Rather, I will quote some lines for your better understanding. In his first visit, he was deeply delighted. In his second visit, he was delighted. Perhaps he was searching for the delightful things that they provided the energy, the enthusiasm to him in his first visit. But how is it possible for a man to find out the things that he had in his first visit five years ago? It is not possible for a man to have all these things all together. So can you say that Wordsworth has, the, has his love for nature decreased? Perhaps not. Perhaps we can say, on the way, on the other hand, we can interpret, perhaps he had that maturation, he had that development in himself. So nothing is changed. It was Wordsworth who has changed himself. Or the change takes place in Wordsworth, not taking place in nature. And whatever changes in Wordsworth, Perhaps it is the better changes that a person can have in his life. Wordsworth had heard the still sad music of humanity. It's very important here. It was not heard when he first came there in the year 1793. So he had to wait for this. So whatever he missed in his first visit, whatever he missed in his first visit, that means... When he came there for the second time, he was just trying to have the beautiful elements, the rapturous melody, the natural outflow that he had in his first visit. He was trying to have all this, but he couldn't find it so. He couldn't have it so. He can be, he can be a bit sad, but he has to be happy to have the development that takes place in him in a gap of five years. Previously, he was not able to hear the sad music of humanity as in his first visit, he was just seeing the things out of the external senses. He was just hearing such things that may be beautiful, may be extraordinary, may be astounding, but he couldn't have that feeling that he has now in his second visit because he is a grown-up man. The development takes place in him. So the still sad music of humanity and his soul was elevated. His love of nature was spiritualized and the spirituality was the characteristic feature of Wordsworth's attitude towards nature. It's very important, my dear friends. 
He now felt in nature the presence of a spirit that disturbed him with a joy of elevated thoughts. And I have discussed it in the class as well. And that was the sublime thought, the blessed mode. And I have discussed it that it was quite like a trance that Sri Ramakrishna Parvamsho Dev had. He was a man who was having that trance. Trance is a state in which one person can live beyond the mundane existence. A person, he is alive, but he, he actually goes beyond the mundane existence of life. And nothing, nothing mortal could touch him. What's what perhaps he is being gifted with that by nature. He now felt in nature that presence of a spirit that I have just discussed and he passed into the serene and blessed mode in which he was laid asleep and he would become a living soul. In such a mode there would be a perfect communion between his soul and the dwelling soul of the universe. These beautiful lines I will just pick out from the poem. You should listen to it and you can easily feel the points that I have referred today. And I was referring to it when I was taking my classes in the classroom. Quote it. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought and rolls through all things. This is the first authentic expression of Wordsworth's pantheism the fantastic philosophy that he has revealed in his poem. So, omnipresence of the omnipotent, it can be felt everywhere. That is, God, according to Christianity, God lives in his heaven. But in the pantheistic philosophy, you can feel God's existence everywhere. You can feel it in the round ocean, living here. You can feel the God and godly existence in the blue sky, in the mind of man. So this is the pantheistic philosophy that he has revealed here so wonderfully. It is in the presence of nature that Wordsworth had spiritual experiences. The beauteous forms of nature perceived by his senses were the gateway to the spiritual world through which he saw into the life of things. He affirms that nature is not merely the guide of his feeling and of his heart, but also the anchor of his purest thoughts and the soul of his moral being. He mentioned in his famous poem, Tintonebe, quoted, In nature, and the language of the sense. Before that, if we actually go through uh, three or four lines before that, it is well mentioned there, quoted, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being, unquote. So, these are the important and pertinent lines in the context of the poem. This is Wordsworth's development and his development is clearly visible. It was not there when he came to Tintern in 1793. So, we can say half part of Wordsworth is created by nature directly and another half is created by thoughts, which is supplied by nature as well. So you can say directly or indirectly, 
nature is all in all to create what's worth as a man and he sees he sees everything now so this is the maturity this is the maturation that he has got perhaps the gap of 5 years between the two visits they have taught what's worth well to recognize his own self it was needed it was needed for wordsworth and for the development of him and that growth and development that dwelt in him during this gap of 5 years finally it was reflected when he thought it out to craft his master stroke here and beautifully and wonderfully he has presented his thoughts so wordsworth had a deep faith in the benedictive power of nature nature girds from evil on the one hand and we can say on the other it gives him peace joy and serenity and it also impresses the mind with quietness and beauty and fits it with lofty thoughts poetry according to wordsworth and you can clearly know what is the definition of poetry i have i have discussed it in the classroom as well as was what's quoted poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings it takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility so tintern abe recaptures his past emotions the dizzy raptures of his youth in the presence of nature and the deep joy and peace and serenity when his body laid asleep his soul had a vision of the infinite here is the first authentic expression of wordsworth's pantheism as well that i have just discussed it it is a revelation of an experience that molded and guided his mental and moral being quoted the fountain light of the day sorry quoted the fountain light of his day the master light of his seeing and tintern abe is the first is the very first poem in which what's was genius finds its fullest expression on this trump and note the poem might have ended and the ending is very beautiful as as the beginning was in the end he said not for chance if i were not thus taught should i the more suffer my genial spirit to decay he confirmed it if he was not taught he, he was not taught by nature the beautiful lessons he couldn't have the genial or the creative spirits he couldn't have gathered the genial or creative spirits in him it will decay so it is the benevolence of nature it is the beauty and the bounty of nature that wordsworth is greatly indebted to nature directly and indirectly and he says quoted my dear dear friend who is the dear friend here on this on this fair river river why yes it is dorothy wordsworth who accompany who accompanied her brother dorothy wordsworth she herself couldn't compose a single poem as the records suggest but she was the creative spirit she was the spirit behind wordsworth's creative genius she not only glowed the creative genius in her elder brother's creativity but also she also gave some impetus to coleridge who frequently visited their house so dorothy wordsworth she was very instrumental for the creative genius of wordsworth and in thy voice in your voice in the voice of his own sister on this fair river why he can catch the language of his former heart and he can read his former places that is the places the places that he sought it out 
in his first visit the pleasures the pleasures you can say the glad and glad animal movements so it was the pleasure of the boyhood days the first stage and he quoted the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of the wild eyes he refers he refers the eyes of his own sister as wild oh yet a little while may i be old in thee what i was once my dear dear sister so how close she was to her brother how close wordsworth was to his sister so it was she who was encouraged wordsworth to write poetry and it was she who always accompanied wordsworth and wordsworth is not only thankful towards nature but he also pays his vote of thanks and gratitude towards his dear and near sister dorothy wordsworth and in the last part of the poem he confesses how much he is indebted to his towards his sister and how much he is indebted to the benedictive nature as well and i will end the poem or i will end the analysis of the poem shortly so on this trump and note the poem might have ended but instead the poem introduces a new figure and i have discussed it the figure is wordsworth's own sister sister come friend you can say and she is none other than dorothy wordsworth so in dorothy's eyes wild eyes rather wordsworth is able to read his former places and if you can turn the page number 140 you can easily see what is written there into a sober pleasure so that course that pleasure that course of pleasure has been turned into sober one so that is the maturity i was i am talking about here rather wordsworth discussed it in the poem and i am just referring that that course of pleasure is finally matured into sober pleasure and he also refers when the mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms the memory be as a dwelling place your mind will be the temple for all this lovely beautiful forms of nature and your memory will be a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies so this similar sort of situation occurred in one of his favorite one of his one of his favorite poems that was swider river what's worth recorded that as well quoted the music in my heart i bow long after it was hard no more so what's what when he came downhill when he was deeply captivated by the rapturous song of the river girl she was cutting the she was cutting the corns and ripping the corns and she was singing and the song was so beautiful so attractive and he was greatly captivated by the enchanting melody of the river girl so he thought he couldn't he couldn't know the language the lang the very language the river girl was singing in but the tune of the song really mesmerized the poet and the poet thought it is the time to record the song in his heart because when he will go to afil he won't have any opportunity to listen to it again so that is why he had bored the music in his heart so whenever he would feel for the music he would just tune it from his own heart and here some sort of same scenario is revealed here though in a different motion he says when when he will try to have these memories he will just look for his own sister and sister's memory will be a dwelling place where the sweet sounds and harmonies will be 
kept so beautifully and he says as well line 143 oh then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be the portion with what healing thoughts of tender joy will thou remember me will you remember me and all these my exhortations nor perchance if i should be where i no more can hear jodi ami na thaki when i no more can hear thy voice nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence yes he speaks if he is not there for a longer time what will happen to him he will just he will just take it from his own dear sister of past existence that means the beautiful beautiful remembrance he questions rather he says not questions will thou then forget he questions but not questions in an in a format we are questioning you rather he was just suggesting perhaps will thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream lines 150 i will i will read the lines and i will analyze the lines and thus the poem will be ended i think you will have a better idea if you if you have if you have shown your patience here will thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream which delightful stream yes river why which stood together tumi ki bhule jabe will thou then forget where we are st- we stood together we have spent some memorable moments we had some memorable moments and that i so long a worshipper of nature he has he has confirmed it he has considered himself that he is the worshipper of nature and he is true he is very true in his revelation here he the came here came unwearied in that service rather say with warmer love oh with far deeper zeal of holy love nor will thou then forget yes he questions not in that format well now he now he comes with a statement nor will thou then forget now you can easily understand my points my dear students will thou then forget you you will not forget that after many wanderings many years of absence the steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves and for thy sake so he has revealed the truest things when they will not be there he had to go back to his own city perhaps he will forget all these things but he won't forget forever because he had that memory recorded in the wild eyes of his sister he had recorded all these sweet remembrances in the in the mind of his sister which will supply a dwelling place for the sweet harmonies and sounds so wordsworth also comes up with a solution dorothy wordsworth she will remember too like him as they were spending the days and nights they were spending some memorable moments there how can they forget it and finally he concludes the poem and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear both for themselves both for themselves and for thy sake so he is not only revealing the true and genuine feelings towards nature he also he he also he also extends his love and thanks and gratitude towards his dear and near sister comfriend dorothy wordsworth so one thing is very clear and evident here how part of wordsworth is created by nature when he was just releasing when he was just releasing the beauty and bounty of nature he was just uh, mesmerized by the beauty of the nature though he had that experiences 
out of the external senses. He couldn't have that maturity that he had got in his second visit. And another half, another half part of what's what is created by thoughts, which is also supplied by nature. So in that matter, nature has made of Wordsworth and final touch, final brush, and that was drawn by his own dear sister Dorothy Wordsworth. And in that regard, Wordsworth pays his love, gratitude, respect, affection towards his own sister as well. So, for the beautiful elements of nature and for the sake of his dear sister, he will remember the sweet and fond memories that he had here in Tintern. Thank you.